Now, sustainability, that's, that's what this is all about, and a very green and ancient concept, uh, which is one of the things that we need more than ever, as we all know, I'm sure. And to talk more about that and uh, how the green vision changes everything, I'd like to introduce you to the co-leader of the Green Party, Mr. Jonathan Bartley. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's really great to be back. I'm very, very local uh, to here. I'm uh, a councillor just in Lambeth. I live on uh, Tooting Beck Gardens, which is just over the border in Lambeth uh, from Wandsworth. Um, I grew up in Clapham, so I haven't moved very, very far. So I'm very much uh, South London born and bred. I uh, feel very uh, great affinity with this area, and it's really, it feels like coming home, being back here. So I've asked to be said a little, uh, to say a little bit about um, how the Green Vision changes everything. Um, also, I want to just hammer home, if there's one thing I'd like you to take away tonight, is that we are at an absolutely critical moment, not just in this country's history, uh, politically, socially, economically, environmentally, but also globally, uh, we're at an absolutely critical moment. And what we are doing has never been so important in the Green Party and also with our fellow travellers, those that are working inside and outside politics to bring about the change that we absolutely desperately need. I don't know how many people saw the IPPR report that was just out today. Uh, once again, reiterating what we heard in the uh, Intergovernmental Plan Panel on Climate Change report back in October uh, last year, saying we've got 12 years just to change this, just to turn this around to avoid climate catastrophe, and it does not bear thinking about what will happen if we do not take the action that we need to take in the next 12 years. And that doesn't mean taking the action in 12 years' time. That means taking the action right now. So, for example, over Heathrow expansion, if we expand Heathrow, if we do press ahead with expanding Heathrow, that will trigger off a, a kind of airport arms race around the world. Other countries will feel they need to expand their airports to compete, and we have a downward spiral. So what we do here affects not just our country, our carbon emissions, but affects the whole world. And we've got to show leadership. As one of the richest nations in the world, we have to show that leadership on climate, on justice, uh, on the things that need to change. So I was drawn into politics very much by a local vision. Uh, it's uh, no secret that I, I have a, a very murky past. Uh, I worked in the House of Commons in the early 1990s uh, for a bunch of MPs, including uh, the then Prime Minister John Major in 1995. I worked on his leadership campaign against John Redwood. Uh, it's been a very big journey <laughs> since then. Um, I, I kind of fell into it. Um, I was, uh, I studied at the London School of Economics and then uh, wanted to apply what I learned there at the LSE. Did an internship in Parliament. I turned up for my interview and they said, well, you know, what party do you want to go with? And I had no party political leanings. The Tories were in government. I said, well, look, put me with uh, a Tory to start off. I want to see what it's like to be working as part of a governing party. And what I found uh, when I started there was it's a very dark place. It's a very sinister place. It's a very oppressive place. You know, you're taught at university uh, to you know, you approach a question by weighing up both sides of an argument and you come to a reasonable conclusion, you know, climate change. You look at the pros, uh, the cons, you look at the evidence for, the evidence against, you come to a reasonable conclusion, yes, of course, uh, what the scientists are saying. Climate change is man-made. Uh, the evidence is clear. We have to take action. And there, you know, you decide what action you need to take. But suddenly you go into the House of Commons, you realize that's not how decisions are made. Uh, you go into the Whip's office and you find two briefings uh, sitting there in front of you for the next two debates that are coming up in Parliament. And there are just a series of arguments supporting your party's position and then tearing down the positions of your opponents. Political ammunition, not a reasoned briefing, but purely political ammunition, and everyone gets sucked in, everyone becomes very, very tribal. And we were discussing uh, just before uh, I came on about, you know, faking it as a politician. Um, none of us, you know, politicians really feel uh, we should be here. We feel like we're kind of flying a little bit by the seat of our pants. And when you think about all the issues that everyone has to cover, uh, from transport to housing to foreign affairs to defense uh, to education, it's impossible to be an expert in all these things. And most politicians, I'll let you into a secret, are totally faking it. They are 
flying by the seat of their pants. They just go where the whips tell them. They read the briefings, they defend the positions of their party, become very tribal, they become very partisan. They have a sense of the values that they believe in, but they just trust their party to deliver it. And you know what? We're in a massive mess over Brexit. And never has it become so apparent that politicians are flying by the seat of their pants. They have no idea how they got here. This is complete recklessness, that we had a referendum uh, where we had no prospectus about what leaving the EU looked like. No manifesto, just a very, very simple question. No reasoned debate, no deliberative process, just a winner-takes-all, yes or no uh, answer. And then the politicians suddenly realize, oh, this is how the country's voted, what do we do now? And we're in an absolute mess because they have no clue what they're doing. They're running around with no guidance, trying to cobble together some kind of deal. You know, it is not any surprise that we are in this position when you think about the way our political system is broken. And in the same way our political system is broken, our economic system is broken, our social system is broken, uh, the decisions that we're making are just the wrong decisions. We are not taking the right decisions to get us where we need to be, and the situation is becoming absolutely critical. And climate change is so much bigger than Brexit so much bigger than Brexit. If you think Brexit is an important decision, climate change just outweighs it uh, by multiple, multiple times. And, I, and friends, I really believe, and I'm not gonna mess around because I don't believe we can mess around any longer. This is no time uh, to be saying we need to kind of just vote tactically to get the Tories out because the stakes are just too high. We need to be voting green and we need to be voting green in every single election. We need to be going out and telling people to vote green in every single election, because unless we do that, we won't get the change that we need. Look at the Labour Party at the moment. They are pro-airport expansion. They are pro-expanding uh, our road building program. They are pro-fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, they are pro-renewing Trident. Um, their position on Brexit has been absolutely pitiful. They want to see 56 billion pounds wasted on HS2, a white elephant that will trample through the natural world, will destroy 100 ancient woodlands, and they are full square behind it. Rather than having 56 billion put into that local transport revolution that we desperately need, 500 million pounds for 114 towns and cities up and down the country that would get people out of their cars and onto decent local public transport, which we all know that we need, but no, they won't do that. They're making the wrong decisions. They are not showing the leadership. I retweeted Rebecca Long Bailey this morning, who uh, on the back of the IPP report said, if you want to see green action, vote Labour. I <laughs> just laughed. It's ridiculous. There is no green transition in the Labour movement, in the Labour Party. If you want to see the change, you've got to vote green. Because why is air pollution at the top of the agenda? It's because people have voted green, particularly in London, uh, for 20 years. In, for the London Assembly. And we've seen air pollution go up and up and up the agenda because we've had London Assembly members knocking on the mayor's door and saying, you need to take air pollution seriously. 20 years ago, they laughed at us. Now, air pollution is at the number one uh, in London in terms of we know that there's an emergency, 40,000 premature deaths every year related to dirty air up and down the country uh, because the Greens have, have said this. They said we couldn't do a living wage. It was Greens in the London Assembly that got the living wage adopted uh, in, uh, for the London Assembly for Mayor and on councils up and down the country. It is Greens that are getting the climate emergency uh, adopted at local authority level. And when you get a Green in the room, things begin to change. Local politics was what really brought me uh, into politics. It's when I kind of joined the Green Party, when I saw that actually a difference could be made. And I'm um, now leading the Green Group on Lambeth Council uh, with the official opposition in Lambeth. And we just got uh, Lambeth Council to uh, accept, pass a motion to declare a climate emergency two weeks ago, which is great. <laughs> and you know what was so funny is as soon as we tabled the motion, even before the council meeting, Labour put out a press release saying, Lambeth will be the first London borough to declare a climate emergency. <laughs> and we thought, yeah. <laughs> Where Greens lead, others follow. If you want to take our stuff, if you want to jump on our bandwagon, that's great. But you know what? We're going to hold your feet to the fire. And we're going to make you set a timetable. We're going to make you flesh this out in real concrete action. And one of the things I love about the Green Party is that we're happy you know, to change the agenda. We're happy when things change. We don't have to take the credit all the time. But we know that actually it is us that is changing the agenda. This really hit home to me when I was uh, working in the House of Commons in the early 1990s. One of my heroes was, was Tony Benn. Um, people of my age will remember Tony Benn. How many people remember Tony Benn? Okay. So he was a Labour backbencher, and he'd, he was quite outspoken, um, passionate about his politics. And for 50 years, he worked at the coalface in the House of Commons. And he was a Marmite politician. You know, he, he divided opinion. You either liked him or you loathed him. 
But whether you liked him or loathed him, you knew that he had experience. And when he retired, he said, I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. <laughs> I'm leaving the House of Commons to concentrate on politics. And he knew that it was movements that actually changed things. Uh, and politicians just make decisions uh, in a context that's set by wider forces. And, and you know, getting Greens in the room, at the table, in the town hall is vital to getting the right decisions made. But it's also Greens outside the town hall, outside Parliament, that are part of those movements and changing things, which are so important. And this, again, around the same time hit home to me when I got a letter across my desk in about 1995 um, from an academic who said, wouldn't it be great if we, in the year 2000, in five years' time, we have a year of cancelling debt in the developing world for the most indebted countries. And I looked at that and I thought, nah, never going to happen. No one's talking about it. None of the political parties are talking about this. It's so far from the political agenda, it isn't going to happen. Well, I was completely wrong, and I'm very happy to say I was completely wrong, because five years later, the G8 was sitting around not saying, can we cancel debt in the developing world, but which country's debt are we going to cancel? And that was because a movement formed. It was because it was a movement of unions and churches and campaign group and individual uh, people. And they, they, I think about 80,000 people formed a ring around, I think it was Birmingham, where the G8 were meeting. Uh, and we used to get um, pound coins sent to the MPs that I was working for. And these, these pound coins would turn up on the desks um, with letters from individual constituents. And uh, the constituents would write in and say, I'm sending you this pound coin. Can you put it towards cancelling the debt in the developing world? <laughs> And it was great, because the MPs didn't know what to do with these pound coins, but it's a great campaigning technique. It put it on the agenda. And they, they changed the agenda. They shifted the goalposts. So everyone was saying, how can we change these things? And the Greens have been doing that. Now, one of the reasons I feel we're at a pivotal moment is that over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen the far right um, uh, neo-fascism, and I make no bones about it, in the guise of UKIP and other far-right parties and certain elements in the Tory party shift the whole agenda in the wrong direction. And they haven't done it by getting lots of MPs at Parliament, they have done it by getting big vote shares. You think back to the kind of polling levels they've got, 14%, 16%, fewer MPs actually than the Green Party at Westminster. But they shifted the whole agenda because the other parties knew they had to go after those votes to get them back. And we saw Labour and we saw the Conservatives both capitulate to the far right in this country. They sold out on migration, they sold out on freedom of movement, they allowed UKIP to set the agenda, and they allowed this whole country to go to the right in the wrong direction. And there is only one way of getting our country back in the right direction, and that is to vote for the Greens. We've got to send the country back in the right direction. We've got to have that powerful, strong vote for the Greens. So the other parties in the center, the vapid centrism, they're after getting those votes back from the Greens. Now, we're seeing this happen right across Europe already. Uh, we're seeing this in Germany, where the, the centre ground is just disintegrating, and it's becoming a battle between the Greens and the far right. We're seeing it uh, right across Europe uh, is emerging. And this is how the new politics is going to look. I'm making a prediction now over the next few years. It's going to be a polarisation, where the centre ground is just going to disintegrate, and it's going to be a battle for the soul of the country. And it's going to be about those who will stand unequivocally for migrants, for refugees, for taking action on the climate, for social justice, for proper wealth redistribution. And it will be, uh, on the other side, those that are going to look in, are going to build walls, not bridges, uh, are going to scapegoat the migrant and the disabled, who are going to say, actually, we can get by by just cutting taxes and make ourselves into a bargain basement uh, tax haven. Um, and that's why Brexit, incidentally, is so important. That's why people's vote is so important. That's why we've got to stand unequivocally for staying within the European Union, for building bridges and not walls, because uh, that is a fundamental part of that battle that's being played out right now. One of my, um, I think, most difficult moments over the last two years after I became co-leader was, one of the first things I did was go over to Calais to um, visit the refugee camps there. And I've been over three times. I went over to the jungle camp. Um, before it was bulldozed. And I saw uh, about 8,000, 9,000 people fleeing, most of them fleeing persecution, most of them having some link to the UK, waiting there at the border, trying to get to the UK for various reasons. About 1,000 of those unaccompanied minors, mainly in the kind of uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 age bracket. And if you told me when I was growing up that 
26, 30 miles away from our border, from our coastline, uh, in the fifth or sixth richest economy in the world, there would be a refugee camp. I would not have believed you. And I would not have believed you if you told us that instead of welcoming those refugees in and those migrants and those unaccompanied minors, we were trying to build walls and actually paying two or three million pounds to build a wall, literally like Donald Trump, and we built it and we funded it in Calais. And we paid for the French police to tear gas people in that camp and to make their lives hell. I would not have believed it either. That is absolutely shameful. And we should be shouting it from the rooftops. What's equally shameful is the hostile environment, not just for the Commonwealth citizens that have rightfully made their home here, but for all the other refugees and migrants who have come to this country and are being effectively told you don't belong here. Our hospitals, our schools, uh, uh, landlords are becoming uh, border guards. They've been turned into border guards. Our society is becoming a hostile environment. Um, and if we have not, you know, we teach our kids history in school, don't we? So we learn the lessons of history, we make sure we don't repeat the mistakes. But you can look back at history, and you know what I'm talking about. You can look back at the 1930s in Europe, and you can see how people were demonized, were scapegoated, how people were divided. And you can see the same mistakes being made in our country as were made in 1930s Germany. And I'm not saying this is going to repeat but I'm saying you learn the lessons of history, and when those lessons, you spot them, you start to call them out, you've got to call them out. You've got to say unequivocally, this is wrong, and this is what's happening, and we need to be, because no other parties have been brave enough to say this. We're the only party that's getting up and saying, can't you see, can't you see what's happening? We've got to learn the lessons from history, we've got to stand unequivocally. Now that action happens at the national level. Uh, we're all campaigning for a people's vote. I'm happy to take questions about how Brexit's gonna play out. I'm sure there will be some questions, but it also happens very much at the local level. We need to get all those local authorities declaring a climate emergency. Whether you've got councillors uh, on a council or not, and I know in Wandsworth we haven't yet, we will. <laughs> uh, we haven't yet. Um, but we can get the local councils to declare that climate emergency, create that movement to bring about that change, to show that people in communities care, and they, you know, we can't mess around, we have to take the action that's necessary, standing up very, very clearly for migrants, for refugees, saying no more, we've got to draw a line in the sand. Um, and I think also when, Sh when Sean and I were elected, those that are in the Green Party, when, I, when Sean and I were elected as co-leaders, um, we did it very much on saying, we need to build on our electoral success, there's clearly something very exciting happening, we've got a lot of people coming from Labour over to the Greens again, um, a lot, our membership is starting to grow again, echoes of 2015, people recognizing um, that Corbyn isn't the Messiah. <laughs> Who knew? Um, <laughs> uh, and, and disillusioned with positions on Brexit, disillusioned with, with the, you know, the subsidies that are going to the commercial arms trade, the position on Trident, HS2, fossil fuels, you know, all these things that we kind of, in the snap election of uh, 2017, were projected onto the Labour Party, you know, cancelling student debt, reversing welfare, scrapping universal credit. We now know Labour don't stand for these things. And it is the Greens that do stand for these things. And people are coming back to the Greens because they know that's how we're going to bring about the change. Um, so that's really exciting. But we need to also be looking at direct action. Um, we can't mess around any longer. I'm a big supporter of Extinction Rebellion. I've been dragged away from fracking sites up north by the police myself. Um, Caroline, my colleague, as you know, has been arrested herself uh, for campaigning against fracking. Um, Sean is an activist. Um, we need to start putting our bodies in the way. And we also need to start, if we don't feel that's right for us, and some people won't feel it's right for them, uh, we need to be defending and speaking up for those that are. So I've been several times out to defend the, uh, speak for the Stansted 15, um, who although they were, uh, do people know about Stansted 15? Very quickly, uh, they stopped a deportation flight. They got in the way of an aircraft taking off. Uh, the government run these chartered flights. Uh, they, round, they book a, a big flight, they, uh, they book a private plane, uh, and then they think, right, we've got to fill this private plane. So they go around and knock on all the doors, they drag out the people that might be illegal, might be appealing, uh, might be irregular in some shape or form. They put them on a flight and they deport them out to um, often very, very dangerous situations. And the Stansted 15 stopped a deportation flight. Uh, they got in the way of the flight, they stopped it taking off, and many of the people on board that flight then appealed uh, and of course we're allowed to stay because they should never have been on that flight in the first place, they were vindicated. But the Stansted 15 were then put on trial facing um, terror charges of endangering an airport. Anti-terror legislation that was passed, they were tried under anti-terror legislation. They faced life imprisonment. They were found guilty um, and I went to speak for them um, several times but 
Fortunately, a few days ago, um, the judge um, let them off with suspended sentences, which was great. Um, which is a victory. Um, but there is going to be another battleground, which is going to be around civil liberties. It's very, very clear. Increasing use of injunctions against protesters at fracking sites, uh, protesting against HS2, uh, standing up for migrants. You know, this is the new territory where we're going to have to, to fight very, very hard. Um, and so it's going to take, you know, some people are going to need to put their bodies on the line and other people are going to need to speak up and support those people that are brave and put their bodies on the line and say they're heroes and not criminals and be unequivocal in that. So that is another exciting, I think, you know, um, frontier that we're going to have to face. How am I doing on time? I've got a minute. <laughs> okay. I can stop now. Um, I want to take questions. I think probably having the questions, I, I've chucked a lot of stuff at you. Um, and having those questions... Um, I think will probably be more, more informative. Um, but I, I want to reiterate that the, the London elections that are coming up, which is the big thing that we now face, and we're going to hear from uh, one of our candidates in, in a bit. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing that. Um, it is a real chance to bring about huge change in London. Our London Assembly members, we had Darren and Jenny um, for, from 2000 to, to 2016, and we've had Sean and Caroline uh, since 2016. Um, the elections happen in May 2020, next year. There's a good chance that we could increase the number uh, of London Assembly members, which would be great. It's a proportional system, um, which means that every vote really does count, and uh, Londoners you know, do very much vote with their heart, which is, which is really great. Um, we've seen um, the, the, our Green London Assembly members get uh, climate emergency declared at, at the mayoral level. Uh, we've seen protecting youth services and increased investment. We've seen protecting the walking and cycling budget, fighting cuts, uh, advocating and getting successfully a living wage adopted. Major, major change. By having Greens in the room, it really does make a difference. Um, so I'd really encourage you to get behind that campaign, uh, get behind our candidates, um, knock on doors, put those leaflets through doors, spread the word um, that every, every vote will count. Um, and we will see, I think, a big, big change in London in 2020. Um, we have the last two London elections become London's third party. We've become third in the London elections consistently in the last two. Um, and you know, we need to build on and consolidate that success and make it very, very clear that we're here to stay. Um, one of our ambitions is for the Greens to become the third party in the UK. Um, that's what we want to see. I think that's really achievable. And I think we learned anything from the last four or five years is that um, some very, very seismic change happens in a very, very short space of time. We've seen the big green surge in 2015. We saw a big surge to the SNP. We've seen a big surge uh, to Momentum and to Jeremy Corbyn. We've seen the Brexit referendum. We've seen Trump elected. You know, things are happening which none of us would have predicted if we were sitting in this room four years ago. Seismic, seismic change is happening. Uh, and I would urge you to get stuck in, watch this space, because change is coming. And there is real cause. Despite all despair, there's a real, real cause for hope. I do believe that we can change things. I believe we really, really can make a difference. I believe we can turn this around. We can bring about the change that's needed in the next 12 years to avoid climate catastrophe. But it requires us to get stuck in and make it happen. Thank you very much.